Hi and welcome to this week's Lab at Home vlog. Um, I was intending to spend the next few weeks working purely on avian sexing workflows, but the outcome of last week's um, troubleshooting has made me decide to do something a little bit different um, for this week's vlog. So if you watched last week's vlog, you saw me use two different DNA extraction kits to extract DNA from taxidermied parrot wings, my little display that I've got here. Um, and because uh, those two kits successfully um, extracted DNA from six of the eight wings, I decided this week I would switch to a different workflow that I have been um, troubleshooting, which is the DNA barcoding approach for birds. Um, so this uses um, a region of DNA called uh, CoI, and essentially you amplify that region using a set of primers, and then um, if you get amplification, you send it off for sequencing and compare that uh, sequence to the database, and it should tell you what species of bird you um, sampled. So since I just have these wings and they're quite beautiful um, and also a bit grim, um, I thought it would be interesting to know what parrot that they come from. So I thought we'd play a little game because if you're watching this and you um, are big on parrots, you might already be ident able to identify them just from these wings. So what I'm going to do is hold up these wings to you. If you've got a piece of paper nearby, then you just scribble down what type of parrot you think it is. And then if I am successful with this workflow and I manage to sequence the DNA and get an ID, uh, then at the end of this vlog, you can compare my results to your predictions. So um, number one, parrot wing one, is this one here. Number three, this little one here. Number four is green with wing tips uh, blue, if you can make that out. Number five, similar size to four with the green, but just a little bit of yellow on the top there. Number six, larger wing, quite amazing markings that, um, grey and uh, yellow feathers. And then number seven, little one but with the most gorgeous dark blue and turquoise colourings. Okay, um, so I'm going to just take you through um, the PCR and gel as before and uh, we'll see what happens. For this PCR, I've made up the master mix using a hot start fire pole. Um, this one's got higher fidelity than the non hot start, which means it's better for sequencing as your results are more likely to be accurate. And then the primer mix I'm using uh, is called Bird F1 and Bird R1. And this amplifies the cytochrome C oxidase I region of DNA, also called CoI, which is uh, commonly used as a barcode for identifying birds, mammals and insects. I've got quite a lot of samples in this PCR. The top two are my positive controls. They're from uh, chicken. That's some genomic DNA that I bought in to use as a positive. Uh, I didn't actually need to use the, both the female and the male DNA here. This is because I've been working on the bird sexing workflows. Uh, one of them would have actually done. And then uh, from last week's vlog, you might remember that I used two different DNA extraction methods to extract DNA from dried parrot wings. So this just indicates that this was parrot wing three um, extracted using the hot shot DNA extraction kit, so 3H. And then the rest um, should all be P. I don't know why I've written D on that one. Let's uh, put P, 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 there we go. So we have um, wings one, four, five, six, and seven, which amplified using the Proteinose K kit. And uh, it said in the instructions for that kit that the DNA wasn't going to be viable for long. 
and uh, it's because the final DNA extraction uh, was left in the mixture of the proteinase K, DTT and um, lysis buffer, which I'm assuming will break down DNA in the long term. So since preparing them, I have kept them in the freezer to try and slow that progress. But I also prepared one in two dilutions of those DNA in uh, water. So I just have the originals here and the one in 10 dilutions. And I'm hoping that uh, they might still be viable. So I'm going to close the lid there. Oh, and of course, my negative control. Always important to have that to check for contamination in any of the components of the master mix. So because of the hot start DNA, I've again added the initial step of 15 minutes at 95 degrees to activate the polymerase. And then this um, program is quite a long one. So you've got six cycles um, with a kneeling temperature of 45 degrees for a minute and a half here. And then 35 cycles with a kneeling temperature of 55 degrees C. So I think this is going to be take quite a while to run. Let's get that going. Woof, yes, 253 minutes. So I'll be back in a few hours to have a look at the gel. Okay, as ever, the exciting grand reveal. Let's see if this workflow has been successful. <laughs> Whoa. Wow, okay. That's a lot of bands. <laughs> Uh, it's actually worked. That's insane. <laughs> well, thank you very much to the researchers who have spent a lot of time getting this COI pipeline working for birds. Um, the top band is the one that we're interested in. And you can see on the second row, there is two samples that haven't worked. So that's interesting. Um, but thankfully, because I loaded all the samples in duplicate, that means that there is a, another sample that worked for it. And the negative control is uh, empty, apart from primer dimer. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to transfer all of these samples to the sequencing tubes. There is a lot of primer dimer here, but I'm going to send them off for sequencing anyway and just see what we get. Okay, so after being so gung-ho uh, when showing you that gel uh, with all the bands on um, and saying I was going to send them all for sequencing, I then thought about it and reconsidered because that is a lot of primer dimer and potentially non-specific binding of the primers. Uh, and I just wasn't sure that they were going to sequence successfully. Um, so I then repeated the PCR with the samples uh, a further three times, tweaking something each time. So I'm just going to explain what I did and um, hopefully you can see uh, the gels okay below. So the, the first PCR that I showed you had the hot start fire pole. So then it has the step at the beginning of the PCR for um, 15 minutes at 95 degrees C to activate that fire pole. The final concentrations of the forward and reverse primer was 0.8 micromolar. And the cycles, um, the PTR program, sorry, had six cycles with a kneeling temperature of 45 degrees C and uh, 35 cycles with a kneeling temperature of 55 degrees C. And that's the one that I shall showed you through the gel box. Um, beautiful amplica amplification of the coi region, but also these very strong bands below here. So my concern is with sending those off is that um, the sequencer is going to be unable to only sequence the band that we're interested in. And it's going to be confused um, by these ones below and uh, the result will be that it fails. So the second PCR, I used the standard fire pole, so that doesn't require the initial step um, at 95 degrees to activate it. This um, maybe was counterintuitive to do this because um, the idea of the hot start fire pole is um, to be better 
for uh, non-specific binding. But I just thought I'd give it a try anyway, and I kept everything else the same. And you can see it hasn't really helped with the um, prime dimer underneath, but some of the samples failed to amplify. So that was not the solution I was looking for. <laughs> for the third PCR, I went back to the hot start fire pole, and this time reduced the final concentration of the primers in the master mix. So from 0.8 micromolar down to 0.2 micromolar and kept the PCR program the same. Um, this time I didn't bother to include the 1 in 10 dilutions of these samples. Um, I just went with the original because there didn't appear to be any degradation of DNA um, in the extractions. So um, definite improvement. You can see that the bands that we're looking for um, are considerably stronger than the primer dimer and non-specific binding underneath. That is still there, um, but all of the amplification, uh, all of the extractions using the protonase K kit have amplified as well, whereas the one from the hot shot kit hasn't amplified, and the negative control is, is empty. So that was looking good. Um, however, I still wanted to just try one more thing. So PCR4, still using the hot start fire pole, using the reduced concentration of primers, I just removed those six cycles with the annealing temperature of 45 degrees C because this low temperature here can encourage non-specific primer binding. So um, the result was an improvement again. Uh, there's pretty much no primer dimer for the positive controls, which was the female chicken and the male chicken genomic DNA. And it's much, much fainter in the samples that amplified. However, fewer samples amplified. <laughs> so there we go. Um, still more tweaking to do. But for the sake of this um, video blog and sending some samples for sequencing, I sent the positive control and three of the uh, extractions from the final PCR uh, off for sequencing. I took three more from PCR three. And then because I'd already um, labeled up and paid for 12 sequencing tubes, I decided to send some of the amplicons from PCR one, just to see whether they do work. Um, and whether all of this was unnecessary because the original samples would have um, sequenced fine anyway. Okay, the next step is to send these sequencing tubes off and the primer. So this is the form that I filled in on the sequencing facility website. This was when I was super keen and went with the first PCR. That didn't quite end up happening because of those subsequent PCRs. Um, so I've just recorded here in my lab book what the samples actually are in each of those tubes. Um, it's not normally this complicated. You would just run the PCR once, not four times like I've done. So don't worry, that, that looks a bit complicated. The idea is just that you record which sample you're sending next to each um, barcode primer. And then on these tubes, I've put the PCR um, amplicon inside the tubes and that corresponds to the barcode label on here and also the sample name. Right, so nice. now that all ties up nicely, what I'm going to do is slip that uh, form inside the envelope along with all of my tubes, just making sure that the lid is definitely down. That would be such a shame, wouldn't it, to leave all your amplicons in transit. And then finally, that's the primer. Um, it's diluted one in 10, and that's the forward primer. So I'll pop that in there as well, seal that up, and take it to the post box. Okay, currently 10 p.m., and it's minus two degrees out here, um, and I'm posting these now to make sure that um, they catch the morning post. So bon voyage sequences and good luck. Well, I'm excited to say that the sequencing results are back and we have an ID on all bar one of the parrot wings that we extracted DNA from successfully. 
Um, so if you watch the fungal sequencing vlog, uh, you'll recognise this interface here. And all I do is I just bring up this um, sequence, select it, and copy and paste it into the NCBI Blast function. Um, let's take that up there, put this in, and then I click Blast. So this is the sequence from the positive control, which um, I expect to be chicken because that's what I bought. And here it is, Gallus Gallus. Um, and that's Gallus Gallus domesticus, which is the chicken, um, which is great. So our positive control has sequenced successfully. That's always good to get back what you expect for a known sample. So then uh, rather than do that again for all the subsequent reads, I've just uh, prepared this already. So the first bird was um, parrot wing three, which was this bright yellow one here. So then when I blasted that sequence, I got a um, Melopsiticus undulatus, which we also know as a budgerigar. So yeah, that fits with that picture, I would say, rather nicely. There we go. So that was parrot wing three. Then parrot wing one, um, one worked perfectly, one had a slightly lower quality score, but um, when I see, um, compared them both, I got um, this one here, Cetacula Cramery, Rose Ringed Parakeet, so slightly larger, as you can see from this wing, but that also fits, that one there. I mean, yes, very scientific using Google, but um, as not a parrot person myself, it's um, a nice way to just confirm what I'm looking at. Um, so Parrot Wing 4, both sequences worked really well, which is excellent. Uh, interestingly, when I put it into Blast, this was what the results looked like for both of the sequences. So there's quite a lot of um, different suggestions here for what that bird would be. So this would be, is this when it's good to have some background knowledge of what you're sequencing? Because someone else might look at that and be like, oh no, it's definitely not such and such, and it's definitely this one. So I'm going to go with the top hit, which is this Bulbo Rhynchus Amara. Apologies for my pronunciation here, which is the grey hooded parakeet. So let's have a little click on that. And that is for wing number four here. I don't know if you can see that very well. There we go. Unfortunately, bird wing number five just didn't sequence at all. And that isn't actually a surprise to me because if you look at um, these gel pictures that I showed you before, this is one of the samples that I sent off for five and it's got a very strong uh, primer dimer underneath. And again, um, from the original PCR, very strong. So I think the sequences uh, struggled to pick out the co-I region from the primer region, which is understandable, just needs a bit more tweaking. Um, Parrot wing six, which is this one here that I think I remarked was rather quite beautiful in its colourings. Um, both sequences worked beautifully well and they came back as Nymphicus Hollandicus which we know as cockatiel. So that also fits very well. And then finally was uh, Parrot Wing 7. One worked really well, the other not so much. So I just have gone with that one that worked really well. And I got Forpus passerinus, which is the green rumped parrotlet. Um, so slightly different colourings. Um, I'm assuming that either those wing uh, feathers have... Oh no, actually, that does look rather similar to that one there at the top, doesn't it? So yeah, I'm happy with those IDs. So really quite excited um, at the success we've had. And if you remember back, that was the DNA extractions from the dried parrot wings for the previous video blog. Um, for sexing those birds. 
that have now been successfully amplified for the COA -I region, um, sequenced, compared against the NCBI database, um, and we've gotten positive IDs on five out of the six DNAs plus our positive chicken control. I am interested to know if you took part in the guessing game at the beginning of this video blog, how your guesses compare to my sequencing IDs. So please feel free to comment below in the comments on this YouTube video and just let us know whether you agree with my outcomes or whether there's one that you strongly disagree with, because it's always good to have that verification or um, conflict from some background knowledge so that I can uh, make sure that this is working absolutely perfectly going forward. Um, so a final interesting note, I was not sure whether the sequences were going to work from my original PCR, and that's why I second guessed myself and uh, did three subsequent PCRs. So interesting to have a look at this uh, slightly complicated page in my lab book again. Um, you'll notice that actually the um, sequences from the original PCR have worked nearly as well as from subsequent PCRs. So that's really interesting to me because I genuinely thought that those strong primer dimers were going to interfere with the sequencing. Whereas it looks like, um, for example, sample uh, five has failed because of something else that's going on because there was strong primer dimer non-specific binding in both of those um, amplicons. So it's good to know. Um, maybe I didn't need to go to that level of tro troubleshooting. However, um, had I not, and had I just sent off the amplicons from the first PCR and then it hadn't worked, this would have been a really awkward ending to this video blog. So I'm glad I went through that process and actually found that everything worked really well rather than nothing worked. And I hope you've just uh, found that interesting um, to observe the whole process. And uh, thank you for watching.